Hello, this week the Mayor's in the chair for another Super City Special. The new Auckland Council structure has been up and running now for almost two years. The long-term vision plan is in place and right now the Mayor and Council are tackling the other big foundation task, the introduction of a common rating structure across all the local authority areas that were merged back in 2010. It's a rocky piece of the road and right now the Mayor's chair is a pretty hot seat. Over the past weeks, we've been testing out councillors and one of the key ward chairmen on council performance to date and what might need to change going forward. Now Selwyn Manning is going to take up some of the key questions that have emerged in our full programme interview with the first mayor of Super City Auckland, Len Brown. Uh, mayor Len Brown, welcome to the programme. Selwyn, great to see you. Uh, your mayoralty began almost two years ago with a bit of a song. But as, <laughs> as is the way with uh, any kind of public office, yeah. um, challenges soon loomed on the horizon. Mm. Uh, one of the first was obviously establishing the super city and getting the function and the culture right. Um, how would you define uh, your mayoralty in that regard uh, since uh, two years ago? Okay, so I think um, the, the primary reason why I was elected as the mayor for Auckland was that people saw me as the person who could actually unite the city, uh, that they saw and understood my love for community, uh, my real ease with the community generally, uh, and the sense that I would be inclusive of my political style in particular. So uh, I, I think that the sense of looking to define Auckland as the inclusive city, and particularly politically, um, has reasonably well been achieved, I think. Um, some, some of the critics would say that the CBD is like this massive vacuum cleaner. Um, that sucks up, you know, the efforts and the <laughs> the, uh, the energies and even the you know the fiscal uh, wealth yeah. of, of the outer regions. What's your response to that? Oh, look, I I think that what we've tried to do is find a really good balance, uh, and uh, that is that I made a really strong commitment during the campaign that I wanted to bring the heart back to Auckland, and that just wasn't the heart, the passion for the city, but that was very much about the CBD, that it, it was our our primary physical civic heart, uh, and we had lost it. Uh, you know, people didn't go into Queen Street anymore for their retail experience. We were shut off from the wolves by the red fences and by the sense that the wolves were walking wolves. We couldn't go back to the water. So now with Wynyard Quarter, with what we're doing downtown, with the number of events and occasions, with the Rugby World Cup, which was awesome, uh, you know, we really have a great, uh, developing great heart to our city now. The art gallery, you know, these have been great attractors that are bringing our people back to the city. But I'm always mindful of the fact that I have to balance that with the fact that I'm the Mayor for all of Auckland. Because I was going and to say... so we, we've got to look after the villages, the 187 two villages too, and I think we're doing that. I remember in your, um, your campaign launch, it seems like a long time ago. It is. <laughs> uh, th you made a comment that you would take mayoral uh, or council meetings out into the various yeah. areas. Has that come to pass? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're out there every second month. We're in a different part of the city. We go to the old, uh, you know, sort of chambers. So we're in Vernon Waitaka, we've been up in Rodney, out in Pukekohe, into Manukau, and, and so we've, been, we've done all that. But I think the thing that I'm doing that the communities um, in the suburbs are mostly relating to is I do a lot of town hall meets uh, and a lot of mayor on the chair meets in particular. Mm -hmm. So mayor on the chair, I get out with two chairs on the main street or wherever I'm at, whether it's in Blockhouse Bay or Titarangi or wherever. Uh, just sit the chair down there and people just come up and they talk to me and and uh, that sense of connecting back to the community, for me as leader mm. and for the new Auckland Council, is about really delivering uh, the message we are for the whole of our community. If you looked at the Super City plan as it was rolling out in the national-led government prior to the Super City actually coming, in, coming yeah. to pass, um, there was massive criticisms relating to too much distance between those who were elected to council yeah. and those who were actually operating it, if you like, or managing the services. The CCO structures, mm. council controlled organisations, that was a focus of much of the criticism. If you were going to now look back and think, OK, I would like the subsidy legislation to look like this, would you have changed that aspect of it? Okay, so first thing, CCOs work in action. Um, too soon to tell. So there's uh, reform yeah, coming. Oh, yeah, well, mm. yes, but n not only that, but, um, you know, they're still settling. And I think by and large they've settled well, uh, given the challenges that, that they have been under and we've been under to get that culture right, get that sense of transparency. So making sure their agendas were primarily public was a big call mm. and it's working well. Uh, Has it always said worked that, well? Mm, no, we had to, you know, mm. I mean, uh, the, the directors and we wanted directors in, and people who had business acumen mm. and, and community sense 
to get in there and drive them as directors. It took a little while to get that sense of the importance of openness and transparency, but that's okay. Yeah, because I was going to raise, you know, if you, what, one of the big things, you know, there was this transition, obviously, in establishing the super city. Yep. But at the same time, you know, the council and Aucklanders in general had to step up to the mark to deliver a Rugby World Cup of oh, international yeah. standard. If you said to the general Kiwi public, Rugby World Cup, the answer would most likely be fantastic win, wasn't it? Mm. If you said Rugby World Cup Auckland Council, mm. you might get a different response. Who was responsible for the fiasco relating to the transport down there? I think this is, the, the, this is the, key to the, the opening night. We, we all were. And look, I, I stepped straight up there on that opening night. And you know there was the potential uh, in a very short space of time for things to turn to custard quite seriously. Mm. You know, it was bad enough for those who were in the trains. Uh, but that was the responsibility for not investing properly in our train system over decades. Uh, and then secondly, for us. You know, I was looking at this and I was thinking, is this a, a product of the CCO, for example, transport, Auckland oh. Transport being too distant from oversight? Yeah. For example, who, who was responsible for the lack yeah. of numbers um, that were being contracted, you know, to be moved, for mm. example? Was that uh, the uh, head of Auckland Transport or was that uh, the elected people or was it Murray McCulley who seemed to <laughs> position himself very quickly and hot-footedly to the outside of this yeah, issue? Look, we, we picked over the bones well of the opening of Rugby World Cup and, and I think the most important thing that came out of us uh, was that, as I say, it could got really wrong for us organisationally but we pulled together really superbly and delivered the rest of that Rugby World Cup with, with a high level of competence and excellence that Aucklanders and New Zealanders are proud of. And so the most important thing about that was, yeah, you could point the fingers all around the place as to what went wrong. It went wrong for us. Mm. And, but the most important thing is we got it right real fast. And, uh, and that was a real test of our corporate structure. And I think in the end, they came through with their banners held high. Well mm. done to them. If you, if you look at one of the other major challenges, obviously, and it's still each in the minds of many, I think, is the Ports of Auckland strike. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there, there seemed to be an expectation that you as a mayor, um, particularly from where you were positioned politically, oh, well, left would side, come, into the, yep. the, come into bat for the workers. Many of those workers obviously voted for you as mayor. Yep. Yep. Um, there's a perception from many of them that said, well, you didn't come into bat. Why is that the case? Well, uh, again, uh, I mean, this is sort of debating, discussing the, the matter in hindsight, although, of course, that's a continuing issue. That's in facilitation at the moment. Um, I, I did my very best to, one, explain and, and reflect on the fact that, sure, this is my background. Um, a very strong sentiment for those who are working on the coalface, uh, but the need for people to recognise that we're new structure, uh, that uh, that structure very much defined and mm. determined what I could and could not do in there and what our council could and could not do. Basically a double bind, uh, not only a CCO but a standalone company under its own legislation. So uh, I tried to uh, give the very best that I could in terms of my understanding of what my role was, uh, but at the same time operate uh, at a subliminal level that they were expecting of me. I uh, so you, yeah. uh, what I will say is that there's still some work to, pay, to play out here. Mm. Uh, I think that the decision by the courts in favour of the unions um, with regard to the redundancies was a very abject lesson and direction. See, some to the people would company. say, and perhaps even some people watching this would say, um, Merlene Brown sounding like a lawyer, not a politician here. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, the criticism seemed to kind of take that shape yeah. when the Ports of Auckland strike was on, particularly yeah. from those down at the, uh, you know, the coal face of it. Yeah. Um, how do you reconcile being a lawyer first off, mm. perhaps, and a politician? Is this something that is incongruous to each other or doesn't kind of match each no, other? No, no, look, I, I'm the representative of the people. I'm the mayor of Auckland. Sure, I've got a legal background, but first of all, uh, I listen very much to my heart. I apply my commercial mind. Yes, I do have uh, a legal background, and that's hugely beneficial to me in the job that I do. I'm able to cut to the chase. What is the issue here, and what should I do here? Uh, but I am mindful of the fact that I am elected by all Aucklanders to be the first mayor for Auckland and to set in place a culture and also set in place a structure. And uh, that's been hugely challenging, and the port's uh, dispute has been foremost amongst those. So I, my, my southern heart, my, my heart from the working class areas of the south, um, you know, directs me in a certain way, but I've also got to respect the responsibility and obligations of my office. And, uh, and I've tried to balance those very clearly uh, to come out in my leadership role, 
uh, and ensure that I deliver leadership that respects my position and the hopes and expectations of all Aucklanders, not just the working hard of me. Well, let's take a break and when we come back, we'll obviously look at some of those costs and balances um, mm. in, in a fiscal sense. Thank you. Excellent. Auckland Mayor Len Brown with Selwyn Manning. Stay with us, we're up to date and we're back in a moment with a look ahead in part two of the Beatson interview. Two years down the road in the life of New Zealand's first super city, we're at the point where vision begins to get the political reality test. It's the time when the promises of a world-class integrated transport system, a quality compact city, an economic powerhouse providing jobs for all our people and protection for our built and natural environment all start to get measured in terms of real progress and achievement. Selwyn Manning takes up the thread in part two of our extended interview with Mayor Len Brown. Uh, Mayor Len Brown, welcome back. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's look at this first term vision of establishing a, an economic case uh, for this modern rail network. Mm. Um, your costings for the inner city uh, rail loop were um, evaluated by the Auditor General. Um, he indicated, or the Office of the Auditor General indicated that they added up as long as the beehive came to the party. Mm. But the Prime Minister, John Key, said last week that he does not see an economic case for this. Um, so there's questions around the beehive or the government's support for the plan. Um, how are you going to pay for this if the beehive does not come to the party? OK, so I think the most important thing is to recognise that we're actually making some very big progress on this project so far. I understand you've been buying up land. That's right, and so there's an agreement by which we would uh, designate, protect the route, and start the process of resource consent. So that indicates a high level of strategic agreement that, that we need to get this route and the it comes project at a in cost place. Today, doesn't yes, it? it does come at a cost. Secondly, um, what we have been re reiterating in the community is that there is a high level of joint upwardness going on in terms of the organisations working towards the economic model, improving the economic model. Remember when the project was first declared, uh, there was a, a fair amount of discussion going on between MOT and NZTA. Yes. So we're now on the same room. Uh, we've got further study or report coming out in the next few weeks uh, confirming or otherwise the economic benefits of the whole project. And how would you actually and identify those economic benefits that you would anticipate in that report? Oh, well the economic benefits uh, relate back to um, what sort of savings we get from getting people off the road into trains and public transport in particular. Secondly, the type of investment that we get into uh, the, the whole of the establishment of the structure and what sort of commercial and retail investment we get around the train stations themselves, what sort of attractor they would be, how many jobs that people would be employed on uh, as a consequence of not only building the structure but the economic growth and development in and around it. If we were looking at the costs of all of that, yep. it, it seems to me that if you're standing back from it, it's almost like you need two plans. If you've got a national government in power, mm -hmm. uh, well then the Auditor General is kind of saying, well it needs their buy-in. You've got the Prime Minister saying, well we're not convinced that there's an economic case for that. So therefore there'd have to be another means of actually paying for it, mm -hmm. unless you get another party in power, yeah. for example, like the Labour-led uh, Labour -led government yeah. are already saying, Labour represents Strongly so saying that right. they're endorsing it and yep. they would help pay for this. Yep. So where, where do you play this? Do you, do you actually have two plans? Do you have one should National win 2014 or another one should Labour? Yeah, look, so we, we've just got to deal with what we've got at this point in time. I don't want to get overly into the politics of it because we're moving flat out. Uh, and so uh, we're dealing with the government as it presently is, with the Prime Minister, as, as appropriate for us to do so. Um, as I say, we've got that final report coming through. Uh, what we are um, presenting to the government is an unrelenting argument uh, for what I see as a no-brainer. Uh, quite frankly, the, the delivery of the finishing of the suburban rail network so we can take the numbers on the rail network from 12 million as it presently is to 30 million with the city rail tunnel in place, mm. halving the times of people coming from Henderson and taking a third of the times of people coming from Papakura. I mean, that is absolutely opening up the options for choice for our people in transport and really unclogging our roads. So we are putting mm. a uh, what we regard as an extraordinarily strong case to the government and we're just building that case block by block. You're a politician. Mm. You, you know the score on these kind of things. If, yep. a, if a politician, particularly a leader, particularly a prime minister, mm. puts themselves and marks a line and says, I am not convinced there's an economic case for this, it takes mount, you know, m amazing efforts to move that mountain usually. Mm. What kind of argument would you take to John Key to say, 
we want your help, we need your help, here's the rationale, this is our message, I'm sure you can be convinced of this. What would that message be? Okay, so uh, putting the rationale and the, the political um, uh, arguments aside on the basis that we have a extremely strong argument that's supported by the vast um, majority of Aucklanders, overwhelmingly, 70, up to 70, 75% of Aucklanders genuinely support this and the need for us to build public transport So that's networks. a political mind yes, that you're saying, yeah, do it or else type well, of Well, no, 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 I'd never say that. Hmm. You know, I think that it's important to, to really keep balance through this. What I'd be saying is that the mandate that I have as a leader of the city, the mandate of the Auckland plan, the mandate of our community at, at, at large says that as a true international city, which you want us to be, competing globally, competing for investment for people to come to our city and building the economic base of Auckland. It's critical that we have a full integrated transport system. You put this council in place specifically to deliver on this issue. I'm elected specifically to deliver on this issue. It's time for us to absolutely deliver this project along with all of the other transport projects in Auckland into the years ahead. Now the second issue is um, you know, we, we will be having a debate over the next two or three months in behind the issue of alternate funding, whether we do regional petrol tax, whether or not we pay for it through using congestion charge or network charge. We will be considering the issue of, so do we do a public-private partnership? Do we raise the funds rather than on our balance sheet by way of... Uh, um, putting together infrastructure bonds options. So you, you presumably would have looked at the Sydney model and the PPPs mm. very strongly yeah. over there, Bob Carr set yes. it up, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Do you see merit in bringing that type of model over to New Zealand which would render the beehive irrelevant on this issue? Well, uh, again it wouldn't render it irrelevant because um, any of that type of work would require government support because we're not just talking about the funding of it, it's how do you pay for it. Yeah, and, exactly. That's and my of question course, the here. It's underlying the government is always going to be a part of the equation. That's the reason why it's important so not to get overly. So even um, if even if you seek the PPP uh, model, yeah. uh, it's still reliant, in a sense, on balancing the books by getting John Key and his people in the, oh, yeah. in the cabinet yep. on side. Absolutely. So if and they stick to their guns, yeah. then where are we? Well, I just don't want us to jump any fences until we actually get to them. You know, there's plenty of hurdles that I have to confront day in, day out without constructing any unnecessary. Seems like that so, we're approaching the fences pretty qu uh, fast, though. Yeah. The Prime Minister last and week made these comments mm -hmm. on Leighton Smith's programme, mm -hmm. News Talk ZB. Mm -hmm. It seems like things are starting to come to a head on this. And, um, you know, that, that's fine. But what I am saying is that we are in a process of developing a logical, convincing uh, and, uh, you know, a very powerful case for the delivery of an integrated transport system based on good investment in rail and suburban rail networks. And so uh, getting back to that issue of so, so how we'll fund it, so uh, the government are aware, and I've certainly had discussions with uh, Deputy Prime Minister Bill English as Minister of Finance, uh, about the possibilities of PPPs and of infrastructure bonds, and there is a level of comfort around us continuing that discussion with our community too. Uh, my so view is that we need to take whatever actions are necessary because the one thing we're not going to do is sit there and do nothing. So as We've a done that before. As we're a not politician, postponing these decisions anymore. So, oh, well, okay, let's look at that timeline. Mm. Um, can we expect in the next month some clarity as to the various options that are available? Yes, absolutely. And, and certainly, well, months rather than month. Um, you know, over the next few weeks, as I say, we're... In the we, spring. Yes, yeah. yes, we're working towards that time frame because the, the next report will come out talking about some of the issues of economic uh, benefits. But, of course, these issues, transport, is just not about economic benefit. The issue of me sitting on the Southern Motorway for an hour when I could be in the train yeah, for half parked. an hour, it's the greatest car park in the world. Aucklanders know this. They do not want a continuation of this. That is why they're so strongly in behind the focus that I bring and why they elected me. If we look at this um, fine balance between the cost to Auckland Council mm. and um, as a provider of the service and the cost to ratepayers as a consumer of services, yeah. um, in previous weeks thousands of Aucklanders obviously got their rates demand for the next 12 months. Mm. A lot of them, even myself included, raised an eyebrow and thought, whoa, that's a lot higher than I ever expected. Mm -hmm. Um, bought a property two years ago, $1,600 was the rates. The rates demand came last week, $3,020-something. 
it's a huge well, increase. you're definitely at the outer extremes of, of what's been going on. Well, I didn't realise until I got the no, bill. I'm very Julian sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, I, I saw, um, you know, the, the statements coming out yeah. several months ago saying we're calculating the rates on an average of a 3.5 increase. Yep, 3.6. Uh, That's right. With, with so the no average more, increase, 3.6. That's no right. more than 10% across so the board. So kept 10% per annum to get yourself through the transition for so three years. So your critics are saying, like Cameron Brewer on the council, is obviously m mapping out a strong position as a critic of issues relating to rates mm -hmm. and he's saying that you have not been forthright as in the New Zealand Herald this morning you have not been forthright and come and clean with Aucklanders as to the potential top level of rates that we're going to roll out um, how can you still maintain that position that 3.5 percent uh, average with no none over the 10 percent how can you kind of maintain that in light of last week's rollout of rates well, I, I absolutely maintain it. Um, you know, there's a, uh, just over 30% uh, have received reductions, literal net reductions. In what uh, areas are they? Uh, the, the, and they, look, generally, when we first started the analysis of this, it was generally in the rural, in Papakura, and in the west. But in fact, it can vary from street to street. This is the complicated thing about rates. Mm. When you're talking about amalgamating second count, seven councils, each with different rating structures, yes. and then different rates applying to same value properties, and then you bring that together, yes. uh, and overlay that with differentials, with business, community, rural, etc. There's no common single um, factor. So it, it can depend on house to house, street to street, suburb to suburb. Uh, but generally, uh, because there were a higher rating structure in those areas, and when you average the rates out, there was generally a reducing uh, in those areas. Okay, if we look at the requirements in the super city legislation that came through from the national led government, when yeah. uh, Rodney Hyde, the leader of ACT, um, was mm -hmm. moving to establish how we would operate the city, uh, there was, like what you were alluding to there, there was a, a demand, yes, that mm. we move to capital rate, uh, val capital value? There wasn't demand, it was in legislation. In legislation. Capital value was regarded by all the experts in the last in, uh, sort of inquiry and report into local government funding as by far the fairest of yes. all the systems. Now, last week, once again, on Leighton Smith's programme on News Talk ZB, the Prime Minister, John Key, said that while there's an element of truth to the cap move to capital value, that you, uh, the Auckland Council has not used all the tools that are available to it to balance or ease that load on ratepayers in the initial rollout over the first three years. Mm. I mean, what is he talking about? And is he accurate? And how do you respond to the ratepayers who are thinking, well, maybe the Prime Minister is correct on this, that Auckland Council did not use all the tools at its disposal? Yeah, well, look, uh, there have been very, there's only one tool that you could have any debate about. The rest of the tools have been totally utilised. And certainly the government working with us to put in place the transition is a reflection of the fact that the government recognised that we the transition provisions in the legislation weren't clear enough, enough or useful enough to us. So to cap over three years any rate increase or rate decrease, you capped at 5.7 for your decreases. Um, was probably the fairest way to transition it through. But, but not, the only not other fair the, for thousands uh, of people. Is well, it? but that's still just implementing the legislation. The consequence of the amalgamation that was the consequence. For us, the average rate increase three point six. Anything above that, consequence of the amalgamation. Anything below it, consequence of the amalgamation. The one thing that we could do, the U uniform annual general charge. Uh, to moderate the impact, we chose $350. Now, the Prime Minister uh, may have been suggesting that we could have had a higher UAGC. If we'd had a higher UAGC, more people would have got increases. The so UAGC, he's wrong? Yes, he is. Hmm. Point blank. You're right. I am absolutely right on Does this. he understand uh, those differences? And look, uh, I'm not going to debate whether or not hmm. he understands that. My view is that, and the, by far the majority of councillors agree with this, and by far the majority of local boards agreed. $350 million was the exact centre point, least impact on greatest number of ratepayers. That was the fairest positioning of the fixed charge part of our rates and a very good place to start for future um, reflections on what's fair or not in our rates. Mm. So the thing that I want to drive home here is that uh, this council has been prudent. A double A rating from Standard & Poor's has been maintained in the face of most other economies or many other economies around the world actually getting downgraded. And secondly, our average rate increase at the local government rate of inflation, 3.6.
That's very fair. Okay, let's look at the Beehive is currently reforming local government laws. Um, within the next rollout of that, uh, that uh, legislation is clearly areas where the Beehive can make a move on local councils to ensure mm. they're working in a fiscally prudent manner. Mm. If you were looking at the position that John Key's led government is taking over Auckland Council's increase on rates, would you fear that should this law come to pass, and one would expect it will, that there will be more beehive interference in Auckland? And if so, is that actually something that should be encouraged? Yeah, look, uh, I don't want to get overly into uh, debate one way or another in terms of where the government's at. Uh, the government um, uh, are looking for some changes to local uh, government. Uh, they're not overly inf interfering in, in Auckland at all. Uh, you know, I'd certainly dispute that. I no, mean, I'm saying the, once the law came to pass. Uh, well, well, the fear that I have, and I've made this very clear, um, you know, the, the four well-beings, cultural, social, environmental and economic, that's what the focus of local government, it's the purpose of local government. Um, I have been very clear in my advice to the Prime Minister and to the Minister of Local Government, you try and define the purpose of local government in more constrained ways they're doing under the legislation. All you'll end up doing is seeing either me calling the Minister of Local Government saying, hey, am I inside or outside the purpose of local government? Trying to define it all the time. And or secondly, anyone who's a malcontent with their local council taking them off to the High Court to try and implement the purpose of the local government in your area. I mean, what? That could be a hugely expensive and time-wasting exercise. There's, there's obviously a lot of vision that is still out there. No one could criticise you for not, for not having a vision. <laughs> it's obviously going to <laughs> take a, to. <laughs> a, a lot of political might and a, and a lot of energy to yeah, actually get to a position and yeah. a will to, to yeah. actually realise that vision. Yeah. Um, we're already two ways, th two parts through yeah, the first th this term. first term. Mm. We've got a year to go. Mm. It was a year out when you started campaigning for this job. Yeah. Do you want to start campaigning to be the mayor again? Oh, I'm not going to use this forum to discuss that. Well, well why not? <laughs> well, <laughs> you so couldn't find a better forum oh, than Triangle yeah. TV. Exactly, maybe. exactly. Great forum. But what I will say uh, is that issue of will. Mm. Do we as a city have the political will to deliver on the vision of Auckland, create the world's mm. most livable city, make this a great economic powerhouse? I believe we have. And, uh, you know, I consistently see out there the people of our city and say, you keep it up, boy. You know, keep going on that transport well, issue, that keep sounds, going on economic development. Are you convinced so, of that uh, argument to keep you in that seat? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> that's, that's not uh, for me to... What I, I've got the will. Well, it must be I, I, I have... At I, the end of the day, uh, it must be your choice whether yeah. or not you're going to run or not. Yes, that's right. And it's a choice that, that is one that, that will be discussed in my family. Some people on the left are saying... Uh, people of the left, particularly those who have watched the Ports of Auckland, saying the left yeah. better put somebody else up because we're not satisfied Liam Brown's going to look after our interests. People in the centre are saying socialist Len is spending all of our money, it's not good enough. <laughs> people in the right are saying, well, we always want our people in there. Yeah. Who is, um, you know, who is going to be a satisfied um, potential voter in that, that dynamic? This, this job was always going to be a little job in the first term. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased with where we're at, to tell you the truth. Um, it has been very much a balancing job, but if, and, and at various times the media and others will pick over the bones of the promises that I made when I became the Mayor for Auckland. And I tell you, I'm delivering on those promises. Have we sold the ports of Auckland? No, we have not, and we will not. Those are the promises that I made. Have we sold the airport shares? No, we certainly have not, and will not. These are the sort of promises and the, and the strong assertions, like the one that I'm most disappointed, not totally delivering on, is the fact that I really wanted to get through free pools for all kids and all people. We only got free pools for under 16s, but it's a good start. You started off singing, still singing? <laughs> oh, every day. And uh, look, it's a great thing. Um, we've got a Waiata for Auckland, and, uh, uh, but I'm most focused on getting all Auckland and singing on the same song sheet. And if it takes literally singing, then I'll do it. I love this job. Melian Brown, thank you very much. Melian Brown with Selwyn Manning and exclusive to Triangle Television. We're back at the same time next week with another Beatson interview. Till then, thanks for your company and bye for now. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.